Hello everyone, this is Susan Gerbeck from About Time Presents. This is the channel that you want to be watching during the pandemic because it's me and great conversations with very interesting people, a lot of them friends of mine. Um, in this series, you will see Janice Boynton, who, by the way, is her birthday today. She's celebrating her birthday with us here on Facebook Live. And we're going to be talking to one of her mentors, one of her, her heroes, who is absolutely a, an amazing person himself. Janice will introduce him in a moment. But a little housework. Um, for those of you who don't know, we are going to record this on Facebook Live. And then we're going to uh, probably in the next day or so, it will go on our YouTube channel, About Time Project. And if you are so kind, if you would please subscribe to us on our channel and also onto our Facebook uh, page, which is About Time Project. And uh, we could use more subscribers. Janice and I, for the last, oh my gosh, 12 videos, 150 videos or so, we've been talking about facilitated communication and rapid prompting method. Um, in this talk today, we're going to be talking to Howard Shane, and we're briefly going to mention um, facilitating communication and RPM possibly, but we're, he has um, a lot more expertise. Uh, we may reference it as RPM or FC. That's just kind of the quick way of saying it. But um, uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat on Facebook and we'll do our best to answer all the questions you have. And I'm going to throw it over to the birthday girl who's going to introduce uh, <laughs> our speaker today. Um, I am completely delighted that Howard <laughs> Shane's joining us today and um, that I can spend my birthday talking to two of my favorite people. So Aww. just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> a lot of you who have been following the series know that I was a former facilitator and we're not going to talk a lot about what FC is or RPM is. If, um, we've got videos that we've already recorded that go in depth. So um, if you're if you're new to this, um, please join in the conversation, but go back and look at, at the videos we already have. Um, but anyway, um, my situation was that I was a facilitator and that I um, uh, was in a position where it the um, communications needed to be tested and Howard Chain was brought in to, um, to do the testing, the double blind testing. And um, unlike what proponents will will um, characterize critics as I found um, Howard to be very respectful and the the situation uh, you know, although it was very stressful um, was made a lot easier by his gentle manner and um, after after the testing and um, um, in various ways Howard and I have um, kept in touch he's one of the people that, actually led me into the science behind facilitated communication. And so I feel um, greatly honored and humbled both to, to um, uh, be in continuous contact with Howard um, over the years. It's been about 30 years since, since all this happened. So, wow, 30 um, years, gee. Yeah, so um, I will um, let Howard introduce himself in terms of what he's doing now and then maybe we could get into a little bit about um, what it was like to do the double blind testing what brought you into FC and all that and then um, would really like to move on to um, the work that you're that I know that you've been doing um, I got to I actually researched Howard when I did um, when I wrote his Wikipedia page for the GSOW project. So yeah, um, I learned Wikipedia a little page bit is in the in the if anybody'd like to read it to get some information, it's there. Yeah, and so learned uh, one of the questions I had as a as a facilitator was, you know, how did these people know when they saw FC? How did they know that that it's bunk really? And and if you go back and and read Howard's um, long experience and history with working with people with disabilities and communication techniques, um, you can definitely understand why that was so clear to him as it was not clear to me. So anyway, um, I will toss it over to Howard and if you could just give us a, um, a, a, um, a feel for what you're doing currently and then we'll get into all the rest of it. Okay, uh, happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. 
Uh, it's it's a pleasure to be here today and have uh, spend part of my pandemic life with uh, all of you. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, for the past uh, many years, I uh, I've been at Children's Hospital for over four decades, and I've been uh, working as a clinician. I, I run the um, Center for Communication Enhancement at Boston Children's Hospital, um, but I, you know, I haven't always obviously been the director of the program. I um, have been interested in technology. Uh, before computers came about, I had developed a well, an analog kind of communication system uh, when I was working uh, in my first job as a teacher at the Belchertown State School in Belchertown, Belchertown Massachusetts, rather an infamous place. And uh, I was working in the infirmary building where I worked with a number of children with uh, cerebral palsy. <clears throat> Many of them didn't speak. Uh, I had no experience, uh, and then they hired me. Uh, that was their first mistake. Uh, they eventually fired me. Um, that was their mistake. And uh, but uh, that lit a candle, uh, lit a fire in me uh, that kept me involved in working with people with disabilities now for the last um, fifty years. The um, <clears throat> What became clear to me as I started to get to know people with disabilities, uh, especially in the beginning, children with cerebral palsy, is that, um, uh, and those who couldn't speak, that they often had a great deal to say, but they had um, limitations to how they could say it, especially children with cerebral palsy because of neuromuscular problems. So the, 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 the difficulties that affected their arms and their legs, um, <clears throat> their ability to walk and to move uh, also affected their ability to speak. Um, and that at the time, uh, there was no electronic communication devices and I worked with uh, some engineers and we developed a communication device, which was rather primitive, it was before computers. Um, but it was clear to me that these were individuals that had so much to say. And um, as the years went by, I continued to be interested in that. I, I went to graduate school and then uh, eventually uh, landed at Children's Hospital, but I um, always had that interest in working with individuals who had really severe motor and communication problems. <clears throat> I guess that brings me to um, 1990, where I went to a uh, to the Isaac Conference, International Society for Augmentative Alternative Communication, in Sweden, Stockholm, Sweden, in uh, August of 1990, and um, there was a talk there on something called facilitated communication. And I remember sitting in the back of the room listening to uh, Rosemary Crossley and Doug Zicklin talking about people who had this undiscovered capability of communicating and all you had to do was to basically hold their wrist and um, they didn't say, you know, guide them, but to, you know, just give them support. And I remember saying to a friend of mine who I was sitting with, uh, that's the craziest thing I ever heard, but what harm can it do? That's exactly what I said. And um, I went home back to Boston after that conference, not thinking any more about it. And a, a few weeks after that, I got a call from a, uh, a prosecutor in Western Massachusetts because someone had been um, uh, accused of uh, sexual abuse using this method called facilitated communication. And they asked me if I would determine whether the message was coming from the facilitator or was it coming from the person with the disability. And I said, I really wasn't interested. I mean, I, I hadn't given it any thought. I knew what it was because I had been to that conference. Um, and then he said, well, I'd like to really seriously think about it. We really need to get you know, to the bottom of this. Um, and then he said something to me. He said, I, I want to know who did it uh, because uh, we want to be able, if, if in fact, um, this was, uh, the, the sexual abuse had happened, we want to bring the full power of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to crush this guy, is what they wow. said. Um, so I said, okay, I'll do it. Wow. Um, so I, I gave it a lot of thought and I worked with a colleague of mine, uh, Kevin Kearns, uh, who was a lifelong friend and we, uh, at least a lifelong, professional lifelong friend, and we created a number of double bind uh, methods to try to see where it was coming from. And in every examination that we did, 
um, it was clear that the messages were coming from the facilitator and not from the person uh, who had uh, the difficulties with communicating. Um, it, was, it was really quite revealing, quite shocking. And um, I think that we did a service by uh, freeing this uh, fellow who was, uh, he was an, an aide or assistant in this group residence in Western Massachusetts who had been accused of this uh, heinous um, crime. And um, so that was the end of that. And then uh, things started to pick up. Facilitated communication started to get a, get a big push. I think because Diane Sawyer had, had said some things on, I think it was 2020 or one of those uh, popular shows and it really started to really grow. <laughs> So it was the media that was really starting to spread it. But um, then there were these cases, one after another, of sexual abuse that were happening. And um, uh, somehow, I guess, if, when you uh, are involved in something like that, they look into the legal cases, you know who the experts are. And so I got involved in a number of other cases. And that's how I met uh, Janice some years ago. And. Um, the, the double blind procedures that we had developed had gotten, um, I guess, it, it, I don't want to say more sophisticated because it's not that it, it's not that difficult. Um, basically, you're just uh, you're showing different or listening to different information or seeing different information um, that, that the facilitator sees something in the and the child or the adult whoever is you know has the, the communication problems, and you ask you know what did you see what did you hear. And um, by being blinded to the information, uh, you can be assured that the, the message is coming from either the child or it's being directed by the facilitator. And time and again, that's what we found. It was the facilitator. As time went by, um, facilitators were less likely to be uh, forthcoming. So it became more difficult. And then a whole string of reasons why uh, they weren't being tested you know, started to come out. Uh, they had test anxiety. Um, you know, they, they, they got nervous and so forth. And, you know, that, that just it really didn't make any sense to me. What didn't, what really made a lot of other sense to me wasn't just the, the testing, but also was my, my experience of working with children. Um, I, in, in, in 1985, I started, I opened the, the um, first augmentative communication clinic in the country at Boston Children's Hospital. And this was a clinic that was, was intended for people who have um, initially was mo minimally verbal motor problems associated with cerebral palsy that soon spread to people with, a uh, with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, because we were, we were starting to, to put into one place, into one clinic, all of the technologies that were developing across the country, around the world. And we would bring into our clinic the most disabled people on the planet, and we would find ways for them to be able to communicate. We would, it might be a switch that you connect, you, you, you control by blinking your eyes, or maybe it was placed under the chin and you just move your chin when, it, when the cursor got to a particular location. Um, but we had, a, we had, I had an occupational therapist, um, Suzanne Russell, um, who specialized in access, computer access. And um, we had speech pathologists, we had reading instructors, and the, the, the intent was to try to test this individual then determine what is their reading level, what is their cognitive ability, what is their language capacity, and then to build a system for them. And uh, so when facilitated communication came along and they talked about children with autism, and I certainly had a lot of experience with autism in my clinical life, um, uh, in fact, we were starting to see people in our, our, our um, center for, with children with autism uh, in the 90s, much and before, much of, the, much of the work in communication for children on the autism spectrum um, was really directed at getting them to talk. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, coincidentally, ironically, if you will, um, it was in part the what became the, the you know, facilitated communication, even though the science started to show that it wasn't, it sort of, legit, it made it okay to try alternative methods or augmentative communication methods for people with, on the autism spectrum, because 
if they if they weren't if they weren't able to communicate using facilitated communication, could they use some of these actual approaches and and be able to use uh, and be able to be, be better communicators? And in the early '90s, because of my work with in, in facilitated communication and and my past work working with children with cerebral palsy, and all this attention, where they said, well, if if they, they can't do it with FC, with this work, my whole clinical life changed to working with children with autism. Hmm. So I could bring to bear all of this technology, all of these different methods. But for children with autism, I didn't, I didn't need a, 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 you know, esoteric kinds of uh, you know, abilities. I, I didn't need, need to get them to be able to communicate by, by reading an eye gaze or by hitting a switch. They could point. And in some of the testing that we would do, I would do simple tasks like, you know, pick up a penny and put it into a cup. Well, if I can pick up a penny and put it into a cup, why can't I point at a letter? Mm -hmm. So, and it, so it just, just it, it wasn't making any sense that, you know, Bicklin, Doug Bicklin said that, you know, if, that reason is because they have apraxia. Well, apraxia of, of, of movement or apraxia of speech, it, it doesn't limit you from being able to point. It, it, it has to do more with motor planning, but you can point. And I, I can give you, you know, many examples of, of things that we did that demonstrated that. So the idea that, that somebody with autism who has, in some cases, uh, Bernie Rimland uh, often talked about people with autism. He talked about some of them having savant-like motor skills. So to suggest that they can't point to a little target. The reason that they weren't creating messages with typing was because it wasn't because they couldn't point. It's because many of them couldn't spell. I mean, it was just so simple. And um, so, if if you don't believe that part, then then do a double blind study and mm -hmm. study and do that. Um, now, that's not to say that for people with on the autism spectrum that we don't sometimes have to use some key guards and bring up some other methods that allow them to be able to better maybe rest their hand and be able to point and so forth, but. You know, within my clinical practice, I have hundreds of people who are able to independently type. So to suggest that this is this small subgroup who have, um, you know, minimally verbal, um, and they 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 don't demonstrate their um, advanced language capabilities um, unless somebody's facilitating them. It all you know it sort of didn't make sense. And the last thing I'll say. Um, about this is one thing I learned from, there, there, there was a, a pediatric neurologist at the Meeting Street School in Rhode Island when I was you know, a graduate student and then I went to Children's and I started you know, my, this program. He used to say, he ran the Meeting Street School and that was a, that was a school in, in Rhode, Rhode Island for children with cerebral palsy. And he said something that what I thought was really striking. It, it, it stuck with me and it still sticks with me. He said, with children with, he was talking about cerebral palsy, but it, it applies to children with disabilities in general and individuals. He said that intelligence will out, intelligence will out. Well, what, what, what did he mean by that? Well, if you, if you know uh, a person who happens to have uh, cerebral palsy and they want to say something, I mean, they, 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 make, they get their point across by their facial expressions, by the way they look, by their smile when you when you tell a funny joke, um, by the way they hit, nod their head yes and no, you can find out anything. Intelligence will out, mm -hmm. and so that, that's that's true for, for individuals with well, on the autism spectrum as well. I mean, I say that to so often to families when when I'm interacting with families at the hospital in my clinical practice. Um, I'll often say, you know, they they're not talking, but if they want something, you know, they'll they'll bring you the remote control. Um, they know how to unlock every lock in the house. Um, if they want something, they pull you over. They point to things. The intelligence will out. And I'll say to them, boy, he's really pretty clever. And they'll say, that's right. He's clever. He's really smart. And I'll say, yes, he is very smart. But what we need to do is we need to give them a communication system. We need to give them a way to be able to communicate that's not depending on somebody else. Um, and and we do that. I mean, we, and, you know, now at the hospital um, in, within our center, where we have a center for deaf and hard of hearing children and, and children with, with some sort of typical, if you consider you know, language disorders and voice disorders, uh, we have uh, augmented communication, but we also have a program called the Autism Language Program, 
we were also trying to find methods for people with autism to be able to communicate. Uh, hopefully they're going to talk. And very often when you, when you get a communication system that works for you and you work your way from pictures to graphics, to, to, from photographs to graphic symbols to letters, um, it's, it's not at all uncommon for that person to begin to talk. Um, Interesting. And sometimes I like to say, you know, the best form of speech therapy is just give them some kind of a symbolic system and it just sort of sprouts on its own. Um, families are always concerned, but I, I don't, I don't want to do this, use this augmentative communication program because if I do, my child's going to stop talking. They're, they're not going to have any need to talk. Well, that's, it's just the opposite. There's actually research that shows that giving somebody a, a way to be able to talk, um, you know, an alternative or an augmentative method leads to more speech. And there, there's, you know, there's research that shows that now. So, um, the... FC proponents are starting to call FC or rapid prompting method or whatever the flavor of the month name is. Um, they call it AAC or augmentative communication. Can you kind of give us an idea of, of why you wouldn't consider FC AAC or, you know, what's the, what's the, for people who are new to that concept, what's the difference between FC and that support and augmentative communication? Well, I mean, the the, uh, the person who's using an augmentative communication system, it's it's been designed uh, to accommodate their actual abilities. Um, it mostly uh, they, they they do this independently, and I you know I know there's the uh, the FC uh, rapid prompting people say, well, eventually they become independent. Well, I haven't seen a study yet that actually demonstrates that a person ever becomes independent. Yeah. Um, but you know the, the methods, the, the the whole idea behind augmentative communication is to find that computer access, to find the way that the person can communicate independently. And not all people have the language um, uh, or the intellectual ability to be able to read and to spell. Not all people do. Many do. I mean, there are children with autism who start spelling in, 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 at, at the age of two, self-taught. You know, there's a term for that. They're hyperlexic. Um, so it's not like individuals with autism can't spell. I mean, so many of them do. Um, but augmentative communication is, is, a, is, a, is a combination of methods to teach a person to be able to communicate, but taking advantage of, of methods, uh, technology, high tech, low tech, you know, computers or letter boards, um, but finding a way for them to be able to access it. The person with cerebral palsy can't necessarily point. Many of them can't. So for that, in that case, then we need to find some other way for them to be able to um, create their messages. So maybe the cursor is going to move across the screen. And when it gets to the point that they want, they hit the switch and then it begins to spell. Or maybe they can, they can spell by just looking at the screen because we have technology now that knows what, what, what your eyes are looking at. And if I dwell at a particular letter, it selects it. You know, we have this, this unbelievable, in our, in our center, we have five different ways five different systems that, that um, can um, read eye movements and uh, determine, you know, in a per in, in a, in a, if a person is, is able to spell uh, or work their way up to spelling, they just have to look at the letters in sequence and they can spell. Um, and and even, even in the case of eye gaze, you know, one system may be better for a person than, than another system. So we don't just say, oh, eye gaze and everybody uses the same. We, we, I have, you know, there are people in, 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 in our augmentative program who are just amazing um, because of their experience and they find ways for someone to be able to, to spell. Or if, they're, if, they're, if, if maybe they have an eye that's looking inward or they have ptosis where the eyelid is dripping over and drooping over there and they can't use that. We have other methods. We have infrared pointers. Um, we have switches. We have large keyboards. We have small keyboards. Um, so we have so many different methods. And in one, one uh, uh, in study, we did you know, an investigation about the reality of facilitated communication. Um, I just put 26 letters um, uh, on the floor on a piece of eight by 11 paper, you know, all the letters. And um, if, if you can't point, then just stand on top of the letters. I can, I can spell, you know, Janice, J-A-M-S-A-Y, there, and I, uh, J-A-A, 
Um, I just stand on the J and then I stand on the A. Um, what's so hard about that? If I, if I can actually uh, spell, then I can find a lot of ways to, to be able to spell. I think I, I went beyond your question, but. No, no, that's all right. I'm, I'm, I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've we've seen um, some recent studies that came out that that have um, people using eye gazing technology, <laughs> but they're using facilitated communication, a rapid prompting method, or whatever they're calling it. To, and and that from what you described, that doesn't really make much sense because you you also get the interference of the person who's the assistant. Um, where you have the technology, five different ways of using eye, eye gazing technology without the interference of a second person. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I've read those studies and, and it's interesting that when they talk about eye gaze, when they use that with somebody who's using, you know, FC or rapid prompting, what they, what they say is that their eyes tend to move in the direction of the letter, but they don't actually make the selections. And, you know, I don't know how many hundreds of people have come through our center who uh, use eye gaze. Or if I, you know, if you, if you came into my center this afternoon and sat in front of a computer, you'd likely be able to spell because uh, it would adjust your eyes. We'd probably ask you not to wear mascara, um, but usually glasses are okay. The mascara sort of throws it off, but you can just sit and look and spell. And that's what people do. They leave very often with an ability to be able to communicate by spelling, um, and then there are certain tricks like you know you spell the first letter and it starts to predict the words. Uh, you know we're all used to that now because of texting, but that's something we were doing in the '80s to try to speed up communication. Um, so uh, the idea that uh, you want to use eye gaze, use eye gaze. Don't don't tell me that the eyes seem to be looking in the direction of the next letter and then making <laughs> interpretations. Spell for God's sakes, just spell the word out. All right, look at the letter. If, and if you, if you actually understand the principles, you just have to dwell on the letter and you can set the time, a second, half a second, quarter of a second, just, just set it up and, and make it work like it works for all these other people. Why is it that we have to and have these interpretations that they, their eyes are moving in the direction? Does that mean they have, what, a praxis of eye movement or what's, what's the reason why they're not just spelling by looking at the letters? like hundreds, thousands of people are doing across the, across the globe. Yeah. yeah, crazy. So can you talk a little bit about like how technology has changed for the, you started pre-computer kind of developing systems for people. Um, can you talk about some of the, the leaps and changes that you've seen in technology? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm old enough and been in this business long enough to, uh, what we, we started with was a stepping mechanism from an old telephone system and had a, a series of lights around the circumference of a circle. And then uh, for these uh, uh, youngsters with uh, cerebral palsy, we put a mercury switch on their wrist and they would turn their wrist and it would cause the light to start to move along. Oh, interesting. And then when they put it back, uh, it would stop and we would know what they were trying to, you know, what they were trying to say. Um, but, you know, that, that was the only switch that we had at the time. <clears throat> now we have all kinds of, you know, different kinds of switches. But that was, that was not what would be uh, considered a digital system. That was an analog system. In the early 80s, um, along came computers. <clears throat> and I remember going to a computer um, store on Brookline Avenue, right near Children's Hospital, and just being amazed at the, an Apple, it was an Apple IIe computer um, and thinking what you could do with that and uh, I met a fellow who was who was the salesman there and he knew all about these new computers and um, eventually um, I hired him um, and he, he came over to children's and we started to develop communication systems using Apple IIe computers and we mounted an Apple computer on a wheelchair in 1983 along with a uh, a power supply, and, and uh, we also had uh, something called the Botrax speech synthesizer, which was this box, and it, it sounded very robotic, <clears throat> but suddenly the person who could create the words could now have a voice. It, it was very robotic, but it was really, it was, it was a voice. Um, so that was kind of the beginning. So you had these components, you had a computer, and then you had this, 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 this speech synthesizer, 
Um, we we put, made it portable by you know mounting everything. I mean, it wasn't it was um, it worked, and uh, we 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 built a number of those systems. Um, then people um, there were also some other uh, sort of analog systems where basically you could they would scan along different lights and they would stop and you would put a template over it and and then we people started to think well why don't we build a um, a, a put a microprocessor inside of a box and we created uh, communication systems so the Pranky Romic company started in the early um, uh, early 80s started to do this and uh, there was Zygo Industries. So, so there was this growing body of small companies that were developing. They were creating all these different technologies. Um, in 1995, um, at Chilton's, we had a license from Apple to, to put a, a, a the Macintosh operating system within a, within a box. So we created a, a, a system called the Freestyle where it was the Macintosh operating system inside of a, of a very nicely designed box with a touch screen. So then you could touch it or you, it could scan. But basically it was like an iPad, 1995, mind you. Um, yes, I, yes, I did invent the iPad. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so now we were using computers in, as a dedicated communication device, if you will. And, um, other companies were just taking a computer. There was a company called um, Words Plus, and I think they still exist. And they would use a computer and people, with, especially people with ALS, uh, were able to um, use the computer on the screen. There would be um, uh, letters and so forth and, and the individuals with ALS could use that to be able to create their messages. And then along came better speech synthesizers. Um, we did a project with, the Dig with Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC, where we created a portable speech synthesizer, which eventually was used uh, by Stephen Hawking. Um, so, so now we have better voices, you know, from the Votrax, we came to the Deck Talk speech synthesizer, and now you have voices. We went from just trying to find a voice that was intelligible, th then we had intelligible voices, now we wanted voices that were actually natural sounding. And now we're at a point, we have a big project, uh, John Costello at, at our shop, um, in our who now runs my the our augmented communication, where we're we're um, creating uh, along with you know work with a lot of many companies. Um, we're we're reproducing your voice, um, and and that's that's the voice that we're producing. So if we catch somebody with ALS, for example, and catch their voice early enough, we can we can produce oh, their wow. voice. Wow, that's uh, so cool. So it's just it's oh, rather wow. amazing what technology is able to do. And then you know, just to buzz back to um, you know FC and rapid rapid prompting. Why won't why won't we take that same person and take advantage of, of their um, uh, and of all this technology to give them the ability to communicate? Well, the part of the answer is we do. I mean, we try to. We'll we'll do whatever we have to to part to give somebody you know independent communication. Um, so again, you know, it, it it always comes back to me to the same conclusion that you don't need FC, you don't need rapid prompting enough unless somebody else is doing the communicating for you. Wow. Yeah. That is so cool. I'm, I'm thinking of people who, um, you know, are able to communicate with accents. You know, you have female voices, male voices, and there's, you know, British sounding people. Or, Absolutely. I, I think that that, you know, that would be really incredible. Well, I mean, you can do that now, and and I mean, look, just just look at your um, look at Siri. You know, you can change Siri's voice. Yeah. Um, you know, can have a British accent. You know, there's so much you can do. I mean, and and you know, now we now we have all these microprocessors, and now we have smartphones, and you know, we just finished three studies using the Apple Watch as a way of delivering cues to children with with um, with autism. Uh, so how would how would that work? Um, well. Uh, with, with many children with autism who have difficulty with understanding spoken language, we will um, show them uh, a photo, uh, what we call a scene cue. So for example, if I say, put the spoon on the plate and the child doesn't understand that, and then I show them um, a, a, either a short video clip of a spoon going on a plate or a, a picture showing the spoon on the plate, and I say, put the, put the, put the spoon on the plate, um, they begin to understand what, Spoken language is 
and allowing them to be able to appreciate Catholicism. And we use that as a foundational skill to then begin to teach them spoken language using these augmentative approaches. So if I deliver that cue with my uh, iPhone, one way I could do that, uh, or I could use an iPad, and I and so then along comes the smartwatch, the Apple Watch. Uh, I don't have my Apple Watch on. Um, I could deliver that same cue. So now I don't have to hold. I don't. Now it's on. It's it's a it's a <clears throat> it's a it's a, a wearable technology. And I want them to put the spoon on the plate. I just send them the message. They look at their uh, at their watch and they put the spoon on the plate. Wow. So we, did, so we did three studies. We wanted to be sure that we we wanted to be sure that it worked. So. First, we compared the ability to recognize that cue from a from a from a, a, an iPad, and we compared it to the ability to understand that same cue when it's delivered to the iWatch. And we found in that first study we could do that, and we used you know five different or ten different uh, individuals on the autism spectrum uh, who could understand the cue needed to understand those cues in order to be able to start that pro whole clinical process. And they could do it with an iPad, or they could do it with the watch. And then um, we needed a lot of children on the autism spectrum uh, aren't going to wear, don't want to wear a watch or or a hat or 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 a tag on their T-shirt. You know, we need to cut them off because they're highly sensitive. So we we then did some training and we learned that we could get them to wear the Apple Watch. Hmm. Uh, so that's the second part of the study. And the third part was, could I send them a cue? They get the little haptic beeping or the or the sound cue look at the watch, follow the cue. So we did three studies to demonstrate that the Apple Watch is a, is a consumer technology that would allow them to be able to benefit from the use of technology. So we went from you know the, the analog to the microprocessor to the dedicated microprocessor, and now we have you know, smartphones and all this incredible technology that we, we are really trying to take advantage of all the time. So if I want to deliver a cue, I can just show it. And I can, or I can send it to your watch or send it to your iPhone. Yeah. So we're just trying to take advantage of all of this incredible consumer technology. And so a lot of things that we used to have to sort of do special are now just inherently, you know, part of all the technology. And inexpensive probably compared to what- Well, it, well there, there, there's the difference, you know, in, in, in January, 2010 was, a, was a, big, a big change in the augmented world because along came the iPad. And you know, if I buy a, 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 a system from a, a company that builds assistive technology, that system might be five, six, seven thousand um, dollars. But I can buy an iPad that does the same thing quite often, with with I with for four or five hundred dollars. Now I'm, I'm not I'm not criticizing the companies. I mean, they, they you know it's a small company. They're trying to stay alive and they're trying to do their research. And you know those those are, and they want to make a profit. So that you know those are the costs. But the iPad is, you know, it, it has changed a lot of that, as has the phone and watches and so forth. I mean, and there's still a place for. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not uh, disparaging uh, assistive technology companies. They're they're amazing and they're just trying to survive. Uh, but they've had to make shifts, um, and so there are companies that just develop apps. But the platform is 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 rather significant. So January of 2010 is a big date in the history of uh, assistive technology. Mm -hmm. Now, did I do I remember um, you mentioned at one point that um, you're finding that people with autism um, respond more to visual cues than perhaps other cues is that am I remembering that correctly or um, well we did some research back in I think 2008 I, I surveyed uh, uh, families across the country asking about their children's interest in um, electronic media um, and uh, so we, we interviewed a number of uh, and surveyed a number of families, asking them about their children's interest in uh, Game Boys and computer screens and um, you know all, television, just all kinds of media screens. And um, we found that for um, many, most of the children, you know, media was significant. Um, that probably the two most important finding is they really respond to animation. And we try to build that into some of our uh, clinical um, methods that we've created. But they they also are, have a strong interest, a proclivity for 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 media, 
they pay attention to it. So if they pay that much attention to media, why wouldn't we be using that along with you know, human contact, but use that as an instructional tool? Because we've already got their attention, now let's do something with that. Um, so they, they, the findings were, one of the important findings was that children on the autism spectrum, many of them spend more time with electronic screen media than all other forms of play combined. So they spend more time with their, you know, with their phones. I mean, that's that's true now of a lot of uh, youngsters. But yeah. <laughs> uh, I think important in 2008 to know that, I mean, and and not to, that they spend the time. That's that's really what they preferred to do. They really wanted to. They they that was their 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 main focus. And so you know, go to the playground. Well, maybe, but you know, I really want to just you know be. I'm, I'm focused on this. There's something magnetic about the screen for many children on the autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah. And, you know, and they'll, they, they, they have, um, I don't know how many families I'll ask about, you know, how much, you know, using technology in the home and how, how uh, sophisticated a parent might be. And, you know, I, parents will often say, um, well, I'm, you know, I'm pretty good, but not as good as, you know, she is or not as good as he is because they're just, you know, they really just know everything about it. And they know how to get to, you know, kids who supposedly, you know, have difficulty with, with symbols and you know and reading and which they often do, but they can find YouTube. They find ways to find the, you know, it's just rather amazing. Yeah, you know, Ka um, give them opportunities, and it's just amazing what they what they can do. Catherine Beals, uh, she's a linguist, and she's got a um, a son who's autistic, and he's learned how to um, edit Wikipedia, but he doesn't know the rules of Wikipedia. He just goes in, he likes ceiling fans. He and he's he's he 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 like in every article he can. <laughs> yeah. uh, she's she's done some really great work. Yeah, we interviewed her on, uh, also, so her video is up on our YouTube channel for anybody who's interested in, in yeah, uh, looking great. at that. But it was it was a really interesting insight she had um, the way she was explaining how people acquire language and um, you know this claim by FC users is that oh, we just happen to have the radio on, that's how he knows all about politics, or we have magazines laying around, that's how he knows how to read and write. It's like, she was she was like, no, that's not how it works. Yeah, no, I, I remember that. That was coming to some of the early uh, discussion, you know, people would say, I don't want to mention names, but you know, they would say things like, well, they picked it up by, you know, the cereal box with all the letters and so forth. I mean, if that was true, I mean, how, how do you explain, um, you know, illiteracy in this country? I mean, really. You don't have enough cereal boxes, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, seriously, when you start asking questions like this, it leads you to the next logical question. And it usually gets down to, well, then they just ban you or they end the conversation or or it just doesn't work like that. Well, I mean, that 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 isn't the way it works. And, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is that uh, the, the, the key to um, I mean, you know, red as one of my professors, you say, you know, in quotes, red light of bias. Um, but you know the key to to finding a way for someone who's not speaking, uh, who or who's minimally verbal, is to find um, that level of symbol understanding that they are currently at, and uh, and then build from there, uh, and 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 to just simply assume that they they already know how to read or that you know they don't need reading instruction. Of course, they need reading instruction. I mean, what? How many children in this country, you know, learn to read without any instruction? Right. Um, I mean, it, 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 it's just be, it's it becomes so illogical that you know you don't even know how to argue with it. That's true. Yeah. That's true. So, um, I think you have a um a memoir coming out. Can you talk a little oh, bit really? about that? Is that oh, is it wow. Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I, well, my, my I mentioned that I was I worked at the Belchertown State School. Um, my first year, and um, I, I um, it was an, it was it was I was just you know out of college, uh, didn't have any real direction, and then I end up at Belchertown, and um, it was it was such a shock to see people, 30, 40 people living in the same room, um, no privacy, no um, uh, no opportunity for education. Uh, and, and so, you know, I was hired as the teacher, but uh, the hired to, as a teacher, uh, I wasn't hiring as a teacher to get them ready to go out into the world. I was hired to just let them, they were going to spend the rest of their lives in this institution. 
and it was just hard to understand uh, how 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 we as the society could um, uh, allow this to happen. I mean, parents in the 40s, 50s, 60s. I mean, it began in the 30s, and and, and um, you know, Belchertown was called the Belchertown State School for the Feeble-minded, mm -hmm. and um, they had. I mean, people were living in in just the worst conditions imaginable. Um, so I was a teacher, and I, you know, I tried, you know, I, I was trying to develop a curriculum and trying to teach, but at the same time, I was just trying to give them a, a normal opportunity to, to live, taking kids outside. Then I got in trouble for taking them outside because they had films, natural nature film strips, and it would be too disruptive. Um, so you know, I got in trouble for that, and then the elevator in the building would break down. So we would have a couple of spotters, and we carry them down the stairs to go to school because the kids were crying if they missed school, and I got in trouble for that. And so eventually, um, and then I leaked some information to the press, and they, and then I, I don't want to take over you know, more credit than I deserve, but there was an expose that did come out, um, and that started a, a, a whole uh, chain reaction. Uh, but it, it, it revealed the truth about Belchertown, and, and, and I think it was a five-episode expose oh. in 1970. And then eventually, that was the beginning of the end for the Belchertown State School. So at the end of the year, um, I, and I had built that communication system I had mentioned, and um, I had formed these relationships with these kids, and then I got fired. And it was, it, it was just a really fascinating year of working with the most amazing kids uh, one of my students, uh, Ruth Sinkowitz Mercer, wrote a book that um, some of people may be aware of. It's called um, "I Raise My Eyes to Say Yes." Um, she was one of my early students, and uh, I mean, I kept in touch with Ruth until she passed. Uh, Ron Benoit was another one of my students who was just this amazing guy who ultimately got out and went out and lived in the community. And um, so I, you know, I talk about my year at Belchertown. So that's uh, what the memoir is about and what it was like back then and uh, what it was like uh, from a personal point of view uh, to see people living in in situations which were uh, settings that were just uh, you know really unimaginable. One of the things they said in the uh, in that expose, uh, Philip Waxstein, who worked who was actually worked for the Department of Mental uh, Department of Mental Retardation in Massachusetts, uh, said that um, Belchertown was like uh, a constant uh, a concentration camp without gas chambers. Wow. Yes. So wow. it, was, it was just awful. It was just awful. Um, but you know, parents had no options. They they would you know they if they had a child with a disability, um, they were told by their priest, their rabbi, their minister, um, you know, put them away and forget about them. And uh, many of the families did that. They they didn't have options, and you know. So now we have community options. Things are better. I mean, they're not perfect. What we have to guard against is, uh, you know, stopping that from happening again. Absolutely. Yeah. How do you, how do you spell Belchertown? I'm trying to look and see. Oh, Belchertown. Uh, with a B E L C H E R T O W N. Belcher. Oh, just, just like, like Belch, Belchertown. Yeah, look it up. You'll see. It's um, there's plenty written about it. Belchertown, Massachusetts. Yeah. Now look at Belchertown State School. It's in. It was in Belchertown. It is in Belchertown. Right. Um, it was like a college campus. Does that have a wiki page? As, yep, there it is. I'm looking to see what it looks like. Yeah, take a look at the oh, image. Yeah, it needs to be rewritten. It's got um, several flags <laughs> on it. Oh, wow. We've yeah. got another project to work on. Oh, okay. I have. All right. Whoever, whoever's, watching me now, whoever's watching this now that's a member of our Wikipedia project. <laughs> well, they, they want to talk to uh, Kate Anderson. She's an amazing person who uh, uh, is uh, really knows the history of Belchertown. There was also a book written. Um, I'm, I'm forgetting his name. It's a great book, uh, The Boys and Girls of Belchertown. Um, it, it, it was a you know a pretty famous place because you know infamous place along with uh, Willowbrook and some of the other institutions across this country. Uh, famous because of the way we treated people. Uh, I mean, that's changed. There, there was a, a seismic change in our culture uh, where we, you know, we went and we did deinstitutionalization, and then we started doing, you know, um, mainstreaming, and that became, you know, inclusion. So, you know, to see all that in one lifetime, I mean, I'm, it's, it's rather 
you know, amazing to, to see how we have um, matured as a, as a society and how we treat people with disabilities. It's just, we, we could do better. Oh yeah, absolutely. Do you, when do you anticipate your memoir coming out? Um, they, I heard this week it's probably going to be um, spring of next year. So it's already in production now. At the stage where, and there'll be, you know, the, the center will there'll be some photos and some of the uh, of the place. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. I am fascinated by this. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, people say to me, um, uh -huh. you know, after many years, you know, it sounds like you're doing the same thing and you were doing back, you know, back then in Belchertown, I pretty much am yeah. working with people with disabilities and trying to find ways to improve their ability to communicate and learn and, and, and to be, you know, citizens. I, th I think that, that, um, <clears throat> Like the approach that you've taken is is complicated and and a little bit and harder. Like when the when I think the 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 promise of FC and RPM is that it's a quick fix for a really complicated uh, so, uh, communication problem. But the approach you've taken and your teams have taken over the years, I think it may be like a tougher road in some ways because you're you you're you're developing the technology. You're but it seems like it's going to sustain it a lot longer, and and you're actually, well, the, I I kind of say while the FC people are teaching people how to point, you're actually coming up with solutions um, to to solve the communication difficulty, you know, to 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 attract to use the technology that people with autism, for example, are are attracted to, like the the visual technology and and whatever. It's like. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a question in there exactly, but it just seems like I have a reaction. Yeah, go ahead. No, I mean, because you, 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 it's it's true. I think that it is it it, it is it is not a simple process to decide. Um, and look, think of the awesome responsibility you have when you're, you're you're being charged with trying to find a communication system for someone. Um, we created a method at Children's, um, and I think a lot of people use it now. We've written about it. It's called feature matching. And the feature matching process is um, I'm going to look at a whole series of domains. I'm going to look at the family domain. I'm going to look at their, their you know, the, the, the financial domain. I'm going to look at the intellectual domain. You know, what is this person's cognitive capabilities? Um, there's no sense in believing that everybody, you know, has, has it is, you know, there are people who have intellectual disabilities. You know, so we as people, um, you know, we just we need to accept diversity. Um, there, there's there's um, there there's the, uh, the the linguistic domain. You know, as as was you know Kathleen uh, Beals saying, you know that people have different ling language abilities. We have to understand what those language abilities are. The different levels of representation. Some children can only understand a photograph. Some children are not yet at a point where they, they understand two dimensional images. They're still dealing with objects. There are some people who can read text. Um, there are some people who can program computers and we need to know the levels of representation. We need to know their motor domain, so their access. Can they point? Can they point with their eyes? Can they point with their finger? Can they point with their feet? Um, can, I, can, I, can they move their head with a stick? You know, we used to have sticks. Now we have infrared beams. Um, can they point with their eyes? Can they hold their eyes? So, you know, you start looking at access. With, you can say, well, let's use your eyes. Well, like I said, maybe the, maybe the, eye droop, the eyes drooping over the, and you can't, it can't be read. Um, maybe, they, maybe their eyes get too fatigued. Um, uh, maybe they can't dwell. Maybe they have a nystagmus and the eyes are moving and it can't be read. Uh, it gets it gets to be you know maybe they're having seizures. Maybe, there's just so many ways. That, that what's the educational domain? Can they read? What do we need? What's the reading approach? Are they sight readers? Are they are they are they able to you know understand uh, decoding of of um, of words? It's a very complicated process. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's like suggesting that you know education is just really simple. Just throw them in a classroom. It's just not like that. Mm -hmm. And that's what that you know that's what good teachers do. You know, they, they personalize the curriculum for the person. And 
you know, and, and people have different kinds of learners. You know, we learned that from Howard Gardner at Harvard's work on different intelligences. Um, so there's different ways in, you know, in that, that people learn. There are different skills that people have. Um, if you, you look at some children with autism, they have these amazing memories. They have, uh, uh, they have, they have, uh, they, they can, they can write, they can type, uh, they can print, they can, they can draw, they can draw beautiful photos and pictures. Um, they can do logos. They, they have amazing memories. You know, we, we want to know what those things are and try to take advantage of their strengths and then, you know, try to build on their weaknesses. But in order to really understand someone, you have to, you have to give them opportunities and you have to observe them and you have to learn from them and try different things until it all resonates. And you need to talk to people who know them. And, 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 and once you have all that historical information and you know their medical history and so forth, then you put the program together. I mean, it's, it's simple to talk about it, but it, you know, it is a complicated <laughs> process. And, and, and it's, not, you know, it's not a one size fits all approach. Children, you know, we, everybody knows that children are different. If children in typical schools, some, some are auditory learners, some are verb, you know, um, and, and some are visual learners. We need to understand that if we're going to maximize any child's capability. Right. I talked to uh, Adrian Hill in this format a couple days ago. She uh, has two sons with Tourette's. And so she has educated herself on Tourette's. She's an educator. She was a math teacher. And, um, you know, we had a long conversation about alternative medicine and Tourette's and OCD of some sort, too. And she was explaining, you know, we were thinking about it. And it sounds like the alternative medicine world offers these solutions that are quick fixes, miracles, you know, inexpensive just give them this and, you know, a coffee enema or something, you know, and that'll, or take, take them off of potassium or whatever, some simple thing. But as she was explaining it, working with her children who have, I guess, more of a mild form of uh, Tourette's, um, um, and she, she explained the years of work they had to do. Um, they had to go through a lot of behavioral, um, uh, just, you know, lots of, uh, of techniques and they had lots of experts and they met with people all the time. She's in Canada. So it was, you know, it was freer than it would be here in America. But when you have two different, when you have this very difficult situation your child is in and there's the, you know, some medical area saying, you know, we, we'll try to help. It's going to take a long time. It may take years. We're going to do our best. Um, you know, it's going to be very involved and, you know, so on. And then you have an alternative over here. It's like, here's a letter board, you know, hold their hand. Or they offer the simple, simple kind of thing. And, and, you know, parents have other children, they have lives, they have other things going on. You know, I can understand why they may go to an alternative uh, treatment if they think that it has equal uh, you know, it, it may, it may yeah. work. Look at, it's amazing. Look at all the testimonials. Plus again, what's the harm, which of course we know there is a lot of harm, but they, they, the parents aren't educated in that way. So that's what I was thinking of when you were saying that the, um, you know, that people, well, what, what you were saying. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, I mean, you, I, I, you, I don't, I, you can't blame a family for wanting to have something no. uh, that's, that's going to make their child a better communicator. Um, that's, that is a great gift and, and, uh, they, they, and they, offer, and who wouldn't want it to be simpler and not more complicated. And FC and is almost a miracle. More sophisticated than less sophisticated. Of course they want that. I mean, I see that and I've seen 10,000 kids in my career and every parent pretty much has the same goal. I want the most I can get from my child. I want them to be as smart as they can be. I want them to be as good a communicator as they can be. I want to be all that they, you know, that they can be. Um, but getting there is, um, you know, that's 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 a long it's a long road. And in some cases, you know, there was there's a there's a line from the end of the Frontline documentary on facilitated communication that I think is so important for us to remember. Um, uh, John Palfman was the um, producer and director of that, and Janice and I know John. 
Um, but what, what, what they, they, he said in there is that you know, families need to come back to um, accepting their children for what they are rather than you know, um, what they'd like them to be. Realistic expectations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 a, it's, it just simply is what has to happen. Well, the testimonials from a lot of these parents, and that's, it seems to be what we're hearing when we, when we watch videos about it, they'll say, well, <laughs> I know this other student and you know, he was unable to communicate at all, and, but uh, now he's writing poetry and he's lecturing and he, talked, and he spoke to the uh, United Nations and he graduated from college. And it's, it's just a miracle, you know? And I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't want to say bad things about a parent because I can't say that I wouldn't buy into that myself. You know, it's hard no, to say. I, I, it's I, a no, very I, heartbreaking, I, de- I, devastating thing. I absolutely and completely uh, understand it. It's just, it's unfortunate that there, that um, we get to that, they get to the point where they think that this is real uh, because there's no, that what's happened is that they, there's the first line of defense should be your teachers, your therapists, and then if they think this is something that's going to work, then you try it, but you don't, you don't believe it. It's, it's, it's there before you even try. Right. Um, and that, that's, that's really pretty um, important. They, one of the problems though, um, that I think is that we, I, I think that our education system is failing children with uh, disabilities to begin with. So uh, to say, well, w- you know, we'll, we'll figure it out because that's, that's how we do it. The problem is there, there are, hundreds of thousands of, you know, fabric, maybe a hundred thousand, but of, of, of really qual. there are lots of qualified special educators, um, teacher assistants, speech pathologists, psychologists, um, and many of them don't have the time or the resources to be able to really practice their art. Right. Um, I, I was, as a graduate student, I had the honor of working with uh, someone uh, named Burton Blatt, uh, he was a real leader in the whole deinstitutionalization movement. Um, and he used to say, there's two things we need to know about special education. One, it's not special, and two, it's not education. So, um, and, you know, he didn't, he wasn't trying to say it as a joke, but in many cases, you know, in many, many, many times the schools do make, they, 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 they make it work. But in many cases, because of resources, um, they, they don't, they, they, they don't have the, the, the resources. Children tend to need more than they get. You know, just, I, and I'm seeing now, and, and the children that come to see me, they're getting fewer and fewer speech lessons, you know, sessions. Um, they don't get enough speech. They, they're, not, they're not getting enough special services. Um, the, the, the curriculums may often aren't, aren't designed specifically for the child. Um, I, you know, it, and it's, it's because we, we are, um, we, we don't have the, the resources, I think. But uh, I mean, I'm not trying to trample on, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of great work going on. I don't wanna um, suggest that everything's wrong, it's not. But we could, I think we could, we could do better. Mm-hmm. I sometimes wonder when you talk, we're, we're talking about Belchertown and, and um, that's kind of the, the climate where facilitated communication came to life and i wonder if it's because of those you know where as a society we're kind of failing um in a in a certain way um and like you said not not across the board there's there's a lot of good things happening and a lot of really good people working um to provide these services for people but i think it i'm wondering if it kind of just opens up um the door for things like FC or other kinds of pseudoscientific, we see that in autism quite a bit. There's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of iffy practices with people with autism. For some reason, it seems to be a magnet. Um, And I'm wondering if it's because of those society, you know, we're, we're, as a society, we could do better. Um, Again, not really a question, but. Yeah, I I, I don't know. I think, uh, you know, you're you're right about the uh, autism seems to be a magnet for a lot of different uh, approaches. Um, people uh, are, are, you know, looking for quick answers, and I, I don't think there are any quick answers. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we did a, did a study a number of years ago uh, where we we created uh, facilitators 
uh, let me let me back up. Um, we we brought in a, a group of college sophomores taking introduction to psychology, and um, we asked them to participate in the study. It was part of their run of the requisites for being part of that uh, intro to the psychology course. And we brought them and um, let them see the first couple of minutes of the Frontline documentary um, where they were told by uh, uh, Dr. Bicklin that, uh, that um, uh, facilitated communication is, you know, a great, you know, one of the greatest discoveries, you know, in autism ever. And um, we, then we showed them a video, training video from Syracuse that um, uh, showed how you could become a facilitator in about 10 minutes, so how to way to hold the hand and so forth, you know, and, and not to guide the person. And, and then we told them that we're looking for a best way to communicate. Uh, and so you're gonna meet somebody who can't speak. And we brought them in to meet an actor. And the actor was just simply told to be um, quiet, silent, um, but, but um, uh, to be cooperative. And then um, we told the, the actor just before each student came in uh, what their favorite television show was, what their favorite vegetable was, um, what their name was, and so forth. We, told, we, didn't tell the, we didn't tell the actor, we told the college student. And then we brought them in and we showed them to, I don't know, where to hold their hand. And then we said, okay, um, what's your name? And then the student would facilitate. And then we'd say, what's your favorite vegetable? You know, I'll become asparagus. And then you'd say, you know, what's your favorite movie? You know, it would be, um, I don't know, um, The Graduate, whatever. And what's your name? Charlie. And then the next student it would be, you know, Beans and, and uh, you know, another movie and, you know, and another name. You know, the name is Joe. Well, it turned out that um, 87% of the college students facilitated. They got the answers. We created facilitators in minutes, 15, 20 minutes, we created a facilitator. Then we brought another group in, 20 more students, and this time we showed them um, the part of the frontline documentary where we were doing a double blind. Janice, you were part of that. And we showed that um, it was actually coming from the facilitator. And then we did it and I don't know, 83% still did it. So, you know, I concluded, well, what the heck's going on? Well, I, I called it the savior effect. They wanted to help. They wanted to be able to help people be better communicators. Mm -hmm. They weren't thinking about the consequences. They were thinking about how can I help humanity? So, and that. Wow. Yeah, I think. Now, when, when I was going through, this is bringing memories back for me about going through <laughs> double blind testing. And um, what I figured out later was, and I'm partly some awareness during the testing, but I, um, there was one part where you were showing um, the student pictures and you were showing me pictures. And, and I think, I, I mean, I didn't know much about the testing at all, what would what the activities were gonna be or anything, I wasn't told any of that. Um, just that there were gonna be some tests. And um, I, think, I think I caught that you, you had like a folder, a file folder and you had, a, you had pictures taped on each side of the folder and you'd like flip, you'd flip it sometimes and sometimes you wouldn't. So I think I caught a flip. Not that I couldn't see the picture, but I, I caught that you were, that something, there was some movement there. And I started thinking, this is, this is why, um, this has a lot to do with why I ended up on the science side was going through this activity personally. And I, and I, I remember having these flashes of like, I wonder what she's seeing. I wonder if they're the same or different. Um, it didn't, obviously it didn't change my answers any, the, all of, I, I never saw the test results, but I understand that um, right. all of the answers were based on the pictures that I had seen and that falls to, to what other, other facilitators have experienced as well. But those, uh, and then there was a section where you, 
asked um, questions about the family, like what was uncle so-and-so's, the color of uncle so-and-so's van or what, I don't, don't remember the questions, but that was the kind of thing, things I wouldn't know. Dog's you know, what, what's your favorite, what's your, yeah, dog's name or what's your favorite stuffed toy when you, when you get home, what's the first thing you grab? And I wouldn't have known any of those things. And I, again, had those thoughts of, you know, I wonder what the color of the van is, or I wonder, you know, and, and then, then there was a section where you took the student out into the hallway and showed her a key, made sure that she'd held it. I mean, I learned this afterwards, but made sure she'd held it. You told her what it was and, you know, made sure she'd interacted with it. Came back in, asked, what did you see in the hallway? And that's probably one of the only times there wasn't any answer. And then you pulled out the key, what's this? And typed key. Of course, you know, it was all like based on what I had, what, what I was experiencing. And, and that's, that's kind of what um, I know other facilitators have, have gone through this process as well. But for me, it sort of just stuck in my head, those, those, those moments of awareness. And I right. think, I think that, that happens to in some way they they understand in so, in some way that the answers are coming from them but you just sort of train yourself not to not yeah. to um rely on those you, you're like looking at the you're putting more weight on the context of the type messages and you give that weight but any of the thoughts like oh i moved her hand this time but i won't next time those just go in and out of your head really quickly but in the testing situation <laughs> that, there's a bunch of you lined up looking at me and i'm like really hyper you know vigilant i'm gonna i'm gonna recognize when those things are happening so uh, it was a it was a strange thing to go through but i think one of the the most illustrative ways of me personally understanding that, okay, yeah, I'm the one that's doing this facilitating. Well, you know, it, it, it wasn't, you know, the testing, uh, just to what you were just saying. So uh, here we have, I show this to the child and then I turn it, but as I turn it, I just let the, the flip over. All right, so oh. the facilitator sees this and then I turn it and you weren't supposed to see this, but it flips down and that's what the child sees. So then you say, what did you see? And in the, the, the early days before the word went out that you gotta be careful, um, <laughs> I would always hear that it was X. Yeah. You know, so it's a boat and then it becomes a pencil and you, know, you take common objects. Uh, then the word went out and they, you know, that, that's when they stop saying, well, I'm not doing that. I know what you're up to here. Um, and then, then there was the, someone actually said, um, the reason that uh, the facilitator saw that um, uh, and said, said this, and the child said that is because the child was telepathic. I remember that there was yeah. one um, one of the master yeah. trainers who said who who facilitated just completely through. Uh, yeah. Tele psychic. Tele that's my expertise. Anything that deals with psychics, that's my my window. And I remember reading about that, and it got stranger and stranger. The yeah. mother, I think, was. Um, but but but, 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 or something. but I remember it. Yeah. Yeah, but the lesson is is that. If you really want to know if this is real, there's something as simple as um, what, what you said. What I, what I remember doing is I took a key out of my pocket and I said, what's this? And then, so the child now types key. And I take out my wallet and I say, what's this? And they say, wallet. And I take off my watch and I say, what's this? And they say, watch. Then I take them, uh, uh, you know, and, and it's, it's all spelled out because you could see it. Then I go into the other room and I use the same, very same objects. And so, you know, so they've already demonstrated that they, they can spell wallet, they can spell key, they can spell watch. And then I show them, you know, in closed door and I come back in and the, they don't know the answer. Well, I mean, what, what other conclusion can you come to? So why not, why can't somebody just say, you know what, I'll prove that it's real. You know, let, and let's get this over with. You know, it's been 30 years and we still don't have this. It would take an hour to solve <laughs> this quote unquote controversy. 
it's not the only thing that's controversial in my mind is that it's still being used yeah, um, yeah that's it, me personally we, we talk about this all the time about um with people who've already have invested years in this and their children are have high school degrees or whatever written books gone on lectures lecture lecture tours things i don't think personally after all the years that we've been thinking about this and all i know about psychics it's not something that they're going to admit and say oh you know all those years that i thought i was speaking to my child well i guess i was really having a conversation with myself or the communicator uh, what, what Janice and I have been trying to do and other people who work with us is to educate people today about what uh, facilitated communication and RPM and rapid uh, um, hands over hands, spelling to communicate, all the different things, trying to, to explain to them, uh, inoculate people of sorts, so that if when they're entering into this world with a child who has severe communication problems, that they turn to science and they turn to um, techniques that can work, even if it is the longer road, but right. they're trying to, uh, and, and when they hear things like spelling to communicate or, or, or facilitate communication, which I don't think they're using that phrase very much anymore no. for obvious reasons, but they'll say, wait a minute, I've heard about this. This isn't this. No, I don't, I don't want to be involved in that. That doesn't have any, no scientific proof, but Janice and I talk, about a lot how the facilitator is probably a genuine wonderful person who badly wants to wants to help um i kind of i definitely agree except that now in the world that we're in living in now if you are producing something that is kind of a miracle of sorts that i think that we should do our own due diligence to at least look into what it is that you're doing and if it seems too good to be true it probably is and, and a quick google search will get you a wikipedia page and that will no, explain I, I, or I, videos I, I absolutely agree um and you know if, if there's any message that i would give anyone and you know my message is always there's probably a there's probably a communication method that will optimize your child's capability and you just have to you know you have to find that and and you know i, I wouldn't start with the you know the Typing to communicate in FC and RPM, but I would, I would, I would try to find a person that's knowledgeable about um, communication and, and knowledgeable about the options that are available, the different apps. It doesn't have to be high tech; it could be low tech. Um, but but somebody that's going to explore everything that's available out there in the world. Um, that the high tech becomes much more important for the child or the person who has a motor problem because they have real access problems. The child with, with us with autism tends not to have access difficulties. They may when they're two, two and a half, um, because they've just got young hands, but um, generally, you know, these kids, they certainly can point and do things. And so we just have, you have to be logical, but you don't want to waste time on something that's, that eventually is going to be either going to waste their time instead of getting an education. You know, they're sitting in a special ed class and not understanding what's being said. I wonder what uh, that too. Being exposed to something that, yeah. uh, that, 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 that's beyond them. It, it's, that's not fair to the child. No, it's the, and the teachers and the other students. I mean, these are kids that are taking special, taking classes, um, you know, history classes, mathematic classes and so on. And, and it, it's it's like uh, like a cult in a lot of ways. Once these parents get involved in these groups, where the parents are just feeding off each other, and you know we've seen lots of videos and we've talked to parents, and they it just feels like they, you know, the idea of finding out that their child isn't this savanty, college educated, independent, you know. I know. It's it's sad. It's really really cruel, um, and I don't think that the parents intend it to be uh, entering it that way. It's just how it goes, and and possibly people who like Bill Bick, Bicklin and his friends, they must know. I mean, they must know what they're doing at this point. I don't know. I just I just think we have to just keep finding new developments, new ways of doing things, better technologies, you know, the next Apple Watch, the next uh, fast processor, 
um, the next way that we can test whether a person understands, you know, graphic symbols versus something else. I mean, we know things. We know that uh, children respond. I mentioned I I, I didn't ever finish that about animation. We know that we can use animation to help as, a, as an instructional tool. A lot of the things that we, that we're, I think that well, what I'm trying to do is not even so much a device as it is as an instructional strategy. Mm -hmm. I, I, want, I want kids to talk and the, the, the more I can make them communicate uh, through alternative methods, the, the more likely they're gonna speak. And that's what every parent wants. Parents want their kid to talk. They don't want them using a computer. Um, but if you have a child who has, you know, let's say they have, you have a child with cerebral palsy and we can create a voice for them and, and give them the ability to be able to independently uh, create their messages. Uh, parents are very happy with that. And, you know, we have, we have, a, we have a, such a huge warehouse of, of, um, of, 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 of technologies that we can draw from. And that, that was what I meant with that feature matching. Is this cabinet just filled with, with all these different technologies and iPads and all these apps and all these switches and all these keyboards. And so I do this feature matching and, and I, can, I can systematically eliminate things that don't work. A kid can't point, well, I, I can't use this. And, you know, and then eventually I'm down to two or three things and I do clinical trials and then I come out with something. That's the approach that we need to take. Mm -hmm. It needs to be based on, you know, evidence or or forget forget about science and evidence based words. <laughs> Just think about this works. This is working. This is independent. This is the this is the gateway to to more and better things. That's that's what we should be thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I that, feel, that's, I feel that's really that's, inspired that's, that's listening to the that's the job of the clinician. About. It's great. What's that? I said I feel really inspired hearing the the resources you have, and and you said January of 2010 was kind of a turning point with the uh, Apple products, and that's only been 10 years, mm -hmm. and it's yeah. it's exciting and it's inspiring <laughs> to hear you talk about just all these things that have happened in this short amount of time and where we will be 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and so even two years from now. It's, it's incredibly exciting to think about what is there the, the, right. we're at the we're at the we're at the beginning of this we are you know if you come into my clinical office i have um there's this door i go i went in on this side of the door there's a um uh a poster of uh jefferson airplane and on this side of the door there's a jefferson starship oh. <laughs> So people have many times have said, you must really like, you know, like the job. <laughs> I say, oh, they were okay. <laughs> and it's there to remind me that, you know, if I was still dealing with the, with the, with the airplane and we weren't moving on to the starship, you know, that's, it's continuously moving. Yes. So as long as I can continue to, you know, go from, you know, the, the old freestyle computer in a box to an Apple Watch, to who knows what's next, and doing things with smart, uh, with 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 um, uh, you know in these intelligent uh, Echo, Amazon Echo, and and uh, and you know the the different uh, different smart speakers, um, you know they have an opportunity. That we, but all these consumer products, uh, you just have to keep moving ahead. And so I guess I'll until I um, stop doing this, I, I I have to keep looking for the next you know big breakthrough. And most of it. It, 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 even even the iPad that wasn't revolutionary because you know we had you know devices that did things, but everything's evolutionary. There haven't been any. There's no, been no revolutions. The revolution was you know getting kids out of institutions and getting them into public into public places and living with their families and and and, and leading a, a normal life and parents and, and neighbors accepting them for being different, but accepting them. That's that's. That's that's the revolution. The evolu everything else has been just evolutionary. We you know we made some we make a little we go to the Apple the smartwatch and then you know there's going to be something else, and it's going to be some computer, homemade or some some consumer product that's going to you know advance us again a little bit more and a little bit more. And you know I do I think computers are ever going to just read your mind and you don't have to you don't have to produce it. I don't know. Probably not. But um, 
you know, be, but do, do, are there computers that are going to, am I going to be able to com control, a, I'm a person with a motor disability and I, I want to be able to control the cursor by thinking? Yeah, I think we're going to do, we're practically doing that now. Wow. So mind control will do that. But I don't think I'm going to say, hmm, I wonder what Sue's thinking. Just a minute. <laughs> I'd like to. I already know what Dennis is thinking. <laughs> we've, been, we've been friends a long time, so I already got her. <laughs> well, I'm I, lots of, go ahead, lots of long drawn out emails back and forth. Uh, I was a very patient person. <laughs> well, I'm wondering about, you know, you have this memoir coming out, but one of the things that interests me, and of course, in the world of sci uh, the, not psychics, but in the world of Wikipedia, I'm always interested in how do people get involved in this world? Uh, I'm assuming you didn't just spring out of the loins out of a couple academics and instantly you have your your degree in this this that you had some sort of journey of sorts where um, I I like the idea of inspiring people to to go into the sciences or or at least think about how like the the story you told of the man who worked at the at the computer store that you eventually hired that's really interesting I I, I love that. Um, you know, this guy who probably had a lot of knowledge and was keeping up on his computer skills and worked at a store and just happened to talk to you. And you're like, you can help me and you can do, um, you know, he's helping in a way that he wouldn't have been able to before. Think about what he's been able to do for other students. And I love that other people, how this works. If you could just like briefly tell us, like, did you have an inspirational teacher? Why did you go into teaching? Oh. What, what was that? Oh, okay, so um, uh, well, I I I wanted I was I was actually a um, I had a minor in education in college, and uh, I was going to be a history teacher, and I actually did student teaching at Amherst High School, Amherst Massachusetts High School, uh, in history, and then I was going to I wanted a job as a history teacher, and at the time there were no jobs, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine said, um, well, I heard about a job at Belchertown State School, and I said, well, where's that? And it was you know in the neighborhood. So I called and they hired me over the phone. I should have known. <laughs> and then you know, my, my first visit was just to, you know, go visit the infirmary building. And, you know, I should have left, you know, I, I'd say to myself, why didn't I leave that day? You, you can't believe the, 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 the stench, uh, what the sights, the sounds of, of what I saw there. And then I got used to it. Okay, so fine. So I mentioned that I, you know, I, I was, I was, um, uh, doing things that the administration wasn't pleased with because, you know, I wasn't meeting the, you know, the, the, the protocol. There was a professor from the University of Massachusetts who was a, uh, uh, in the communication disorders department, who was a consultant. And he came to my classroom and um, liked, he, he liked the discussion we had about this, uh, this idea that I had for a communication uh, the system. And, uh, and he just kept coming back to my class. And then we, we, I got to know him and he kept saying, well, I want you to go to graduate school. I said, no, I'm, I'm perfectly happy. I'm a teacher. I'm going to do that for a while, maybe someday. So one spring day when I got my letter that said, um, you know, you're done, you're not, you know, you're, you're fired. Um, I showed him the letter. You know, first he walked over to me that I remember this so distinctly. He came over and said, why do you look so forlorn? I said, look at this. And I show him the letter. He reads it. Blah, blah, blah. He looked at me and said, what'd you expect? <laughs> what'd you expect? And I said, he said, so what are you going to do now? And I, I don't know, encyclopedia, sell encyclopedia. I, mean, I don't know. I had no plans. And he said, you're going to go to graduate school. You know, you're going to, and he said, you know, you need to be able to do the things that you do, but you need to have a degree. So he just inspired me. He sort of said, this is what you need to do. And he, he, he kind of adopted me. <laughs> in his life. I mean, really, I mean, I'm I'm 22 years old, and so he's he uh, um, he 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 actually after I got fired and after I got accepted into the master's program, he then uh, said, "You're going to continue with that project, what you were doing with that machine." And he 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 talked to the superintendent. And the superintendent said, "We don't want him. He's a troublemaker." <laughs> and, then, and Henry said, "You don't know what trouble is if he doesn't get this consulting." Good trouble, good so night. I'm back. John Lewis would say. So yeah, so come September, you know, I'm I'm back there working at Belchertown as a, now I'm a consultant, and so I, you know, so I went there, and then 
you know, I went to graduate school and then I'm ready to go out. And they said, no, no, you've got to continue. And so they, and so I was interested in two things. I was interested in cerebral palsy and I was interested in advocacy and, and deinstitutionalization. So at Syracuse, Ruth Lencion was a professor who, who had done some original work in cerebral palsy and Bert Blatt, who I mentioned, you know, the uh, two things we need to know about special education. He was the, he was the director of special education. And he was, he ran the Center on Human Policy where they were trying to, you know, every day, every week we met to talk about deinstitutionalization. It was the perfect place for me. So I went there. So I was inspired by them, the, the two of them. And then I'm, you know, ready to do my dissertation. And, 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 and my, my advisor now, Ruth Lencion, she's leaving and she says, oh, but I know some, I, here's what you need to do. And um, so then I applied for a fellowship and I went to the Mayo Clinic. And so I was inspired by Fred Darley. At the, so I had all these incredible mentors. I mean, I've been incredibly lucky. So he was like the guy that was studying motor speech disorders in this country. That's what I mean. He, he's the one who, uh, I mean, I know, you know, a praxis of speech. He's the guy that sort of put all the research together, did the systematic reviews with all of his fellows, you know, and we came to, this, we understand what a praxis of speech is because of Fred Darley. And here I was as a, a descendant, you know, of, of that kind of thinking. So when I hear this stuff about apraxia, you know, I said, that's just nonsense. I, I know what apraxia is. I mean, I, I did a doctoral dissertation on apraxia of speech. And so, um, so I got inspired by him. And then from there, I went to the University of Vermont for a few years and then Children's Hospital, and I never left. I was told by Alan Crocker, you talk about an, an incredible advocate for people with disabilities. Uh, my first day at Children's Hospital, he said, well, one thing you need to know about children's, well, once you come here, there's nowhere else to go. I said, oh, come on. <laughs> so 40 years later, here I am. <laughs> so anyway, so I've been in, I've had incredible um, good fortune to meet just these amazing people, uh, amazing leaders and, 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 and inspirational advocates and clinicians and so forth. So, you know, I'm just, I'm just a, what did Sir Isaac Newton say? You know, I stood on the shoulder of giants, all I have for sure. Well, I really appreciate uh, what I'm learning. And one of the things that you said earlier was how you were thinking when they contacted you about facilitated communication, you'd heard about Crosley at that Swedish conference and you said, nah, I don't really know. And then they're like, no, no, we really would like you to get involved because it's going to really make a difference in somebody's life. And, and I really appreciate that you did that. And what, and Janice here is here because of you and, and the things that you've done. And Janice has, and I'm not just saying this because it's her birthday and all. <laughs> Janice, this is inspiring. She is um, a motivated, wonderful person. She's been a good friend of mine for years. She joined up with my Wikipedia project 2014 or something like that. And I didn't know much about facilitated communication, all just what James Randi had, had written about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because of you, because of your intervention and because Janice was the person she is and she's science minded, whether even though she didn't have a background necessarily in science, but she was really interested in what was going on. And, and she was one of those facilitators who, who, who when she was tested, even though I don't think she was excited about being tested, um, it took her some a while to wrap her mind about around what had happened to her. And I really appreciate that what you know, you're talking about these other mentors who had been um, important to you and you're rising to the, the depths that you are where you're able to help people. I think that you've acted in, in Janice's case as, as this amazing mentor to, to be there for her. And so that she came to a point where she found the skeptic community and, and I got to meet her. And I really appreciate that because I think Janice is doing amazing things and she's helping out people and we may never know how many uh, people we've helped by getting these stories out, educating, right. writing the Wikipedia pages, which are read hundreds of thousands of people are reading the Wikipedia pages that we write and, and get great information out there. And I, I, I wanted you to know how much I appreciate that you, what you did for Janice. Well, thank you. But let, let, let me say, let me just say something about uh, my meeting with Janice. So she, you know, she, she's just, 
this facilitator and I go in and I do the testing. And I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, kind, because I'd like to think that I am as a person. Um, but um, after this was over, I mean, I just flew home and, you know, that was the end. But then I heard from Janice. Mm -hmm. um, and I realized um, she was devastated. Yes. She was absolutely devastated. So, you know, we, you know, I, I talked to her and I remember in the beginning by phone, I don't know, every week for a while, um, she wrote poetry about her. And it was that how, how much this had affected her life. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I had an, I felt an obligation to, to listen to her and to, you know, give her what little guidance I could. But um, it was, it was quite clear how much this had, had, had hurt her. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, she became, being the person she is, she was so introspective about it. And I learned a lot of that later on too. And then we, you know, we connected again. Um, at one point, um, they, were, they were doing a, uh, a, a special issue of a journal um, on um, FC. And I remember saying, you know, you should tell your story. Um, and then she wrote, you know, the, just this amazing yeah. uh, paper about, you know, confessions of a former facilitator. I mean, that gets, you know, I, I, you know you, she got you at confessions, you know, it was one of those, it was just, it was just amazing. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then she, you know, she's hooked up with this group of um, people who are, uh, invested in and in dedicated to trying to get the truth out. Um, she saw that she's like, she's like our spiritual leader. Yeah. She's so, amazing. Uh, it's yeah, funny no, talking no. about her as if she's not in, I know, in the I know. conversation. So, um, <laughs> I know that um, my, my wife um, had, um, when she had cancer, she said, you know, it's the best thing that happened to me because it changed her life in a positive way. You know, and, and uh, I think that, um, with Janice, probably it's a good thing that she was a facilitator in its own way, because it changed her in a way that made her even a better person. I'm not. I'm not taking any credit for that, by the way. But I, I think that um, she's she's just amazing. Yeah, I, I totally agree. When when I was 50, I found out I had breast cancer, and I know I agree exactly what your wife said. It was like a wake up moment, and it really. Uh, but, you know, not for everybody. I wouldn't recommend getting cancer for no, I, I, <laughs> to uh, have a life-changing yeah. event. But it, what it does is it it really helps you uh, get your priorities and your perspectives. Well, for some people, and, and it sure as heck did for me. I know that Janice, uh, again, it's weird, like I said, speaking as if she's not there. But uh, I know she's felt a lot of guilt. And... Um, at what happened and when her and I first started talking she was like I don't know if, how my story is going to be receptive you know if people are going to how they're going to feel about it they're going to blame me and I think that every time she speaks out every video we do everything she's done is a way of um, helping out that family that she was involved with before it, it's like saying you know no you you it's not your fault you know, this is, you were led into this and I, and her herself was led into this too. And it was the fault of other um, reasons. And, and I feel that um, she has nothing to feel bad about. She's more than, more than atoned for anything she might've done. It's just, it's, it's been amazing to watch her transformation. And when she, she spoke at PsyCon last year, that was incredible. The kids were coming up to her. There was, kids we had we had um, sponsored to be at the school and they came up to her afterwards and she just was so welcoming and and, and it was wonderful to watch their interaction with her and I felt like you're looking at these children who are thinking they're still in high school and middle school and they're thinking I wonder what I would go into in my life you know I wonder if science might be a career for me or mm -hmm. or some sort of advocacy and I thought it was inspiring yeah well, I think that um, having somebody who uh, who inspires you is, I think, uh, I think that that is a, a key to the success of many people. It's somebody who um, you can trust and look up to and learn right. from. Somebody stepped up, and that's why their life improved. Yeah. Well. Uh <laughs> Oh, were you on mute? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually very emotional at the moment. But I will say that 
there weren't a lot of people at the time who understood even even remotely what I was going through. And mm -hmm. Howard, you're one of those people. And I don't know, there's not much I could say without that you haven't heard before, but I use that as an example. I use your kindness and your willingness to, to live, um, ask questions and, and provide me with feedback to help me understand what happened and why. And I don't know if I'll ever know that 100%, but I think that I've come quite a long ways in, in understanding that. And that's because of the the road that that you opened, the avenue that you opened up. And and what what I see that's changed from those early days to now is that now there's a whole network of us that are, are and you were talking about it in your program too, Howard, where it's not just speech language people, it's speech language people and, and reading teachers and special educate, excuse me, special educators. And now the, the, the issue of facilitated communication is being looked at by um, psychologists and um, speech people and um, former facilitators and linguists and, and, and musicians. The <laughs> and James James Randy. Randy. Yeah. I don't know if you know Howard, James Randi um, is a, a pretty well-known um, magician in the skeptic community and he debunked a lot of um, like psychic kind of things, but he was called in to investigate psychic abilities at the, um, yeah, I think it was Madison, Wisconsin and uh, the university there. And uh, he, realized that they were using facilitated communication and he suggested that they test the fc first before they test the, the psychic ability and they pretty much fired him from the from the <laughs> job you know they're like no we're not going to do that but um now i'm regaining my composure a little bit. <laughs> it, you you take something that's i mean i think i mean i have a lot of compassion for facilitators and my interest is to to hopefully lead other facilitators into a direction of, of questioning their behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of that happened because um, like going into the testing situation, I was kind of set up by the FC people to 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 expect something that it wasn't. You know, it, it wasn't really clinical. It was it was in a in a classroom where the both the my my student and I had were familiar with. It was there was it was a comfortable pace. It was you know it wasn't like this you know like lab kind of setting you know that that they kind of set you up for, and and I think that also your demeanor, your respect, both. I mean. I can guess that that you knew even before you went into it what the outcome was going to be, but that's not the way you treated me. Was let's see, let's let's go through these steps and see what's going on. Excuse me. Um, well, I think that it's you have to you know each time you do it, you need to think maybe there's somebody where it 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 you know it's helping them. Um, one of the problems, you know, they did a, there was a 60 minute piece on facilitated communication in the 90s and um, Morley Safer, if you remember him. Yeah, I remember minutes, him. He was interviewing the family of the child who was being facilitated and the, and the dad said, I don't know why they keep holding his hand. He could spell long before they started holding his hand. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> Even, I mean, I just watched um, Wretches and Jabberers and that was, um, I hadn't watched it before. That was really interesting. And and the the two main um, people with disabilities that speech that are featured in the film can actually speak and type, um, mm -hmm. and it on their own, and and um, it's just not at the same level as when they're somebody's holding their hand and typing, and and it, it's sort of like um, kind of an eye opener, you know, how that could actually happen. That that that. I'm interested in kind of the psychology of it. Like, how do you how do you trick yourself into believing that this is working? I, I don't have a problem that somebody thinks they're that that facilitation is real because 
you know, we, we, like I said, we, we created facilitators in minutes. Um, what I have a problem with is that they're unwilling to um, participate in a way that simply can answer whether or not it's real or not. Mm -hmm. So if you believe it's real, then, you know, take the test. And if, if, it, and if we come across somebody who legitimately is able to, you know, they just need some physical support. I mean, we see kids in our clinic who, who require some kind of physical support. I mean, some children with cerebral palsy, you know, they, you'll see the clinician will, will or, the, or their family or the, 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 the orthopedic person make, because of the, 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 the hyper, the hyper movement, they may tie their hand down so they're not, you know, moving it. So, or, or you give them, you give people some support. That, that's not unusual. Or, you know, if a person starts to spell and you say, oh, is this the word? Is this the word? You know, it, it's, 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 um, uh, co, uh, there's a word for it and I'm blocking on it. Um, but, you know, we, we, we can, we can interact with, um, with somebody in a way that uh, it, it helps them and guides them and leads them. But that's, that's not what facilitated communications. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's just a difference. Co-construction of meaning where you, you're, you know, you're working with them. It's, a, it's an accepted sort of approach. Um, is this the letter you mean? Is this the letter you mean? There's assisted scanning um, where you, so um, I'm, I'm, you're, I'm you're, we're both looking at this letter board and I'm going, is it this one? Blink when I get to the one you want. And then they blink, so oh, you want the B. Okay, blink when you get to the one you want. You know, that's, that's uh, th those are all accepted methods, but you know at some point you've got to be able to know who's really doing it. And if right. you don't know, mm -hmm. you know it's not fair to the child. It's not very fair to the family. It's not even fair to the facilitator. No, no, they're just perpetuating a hoax. Yeah, and when they find out, if they find out what was really going on it can be devastating to everybody the family it can be of some probably i don't think everyone is has quite the same um uh sensitivity that jenna says but i think for some people they just move on and they don't think about it again but that's not true obviously not true of everyone not yeah we don't know uh, who those people i are. think i think my sensitivity comes from the the false allegations of abuse i think if it had if it had been tested before that point then I could have just moved on as well, but like, I think because oh, this of- cool. How did I do that? That's interesting. Moving yeah. on with my life now. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you did that introspection. You, you, you did go back and try to, you did. And so, I mean, you've gone way beyond what you had to do, but anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, I think it's true that for many years and, and I, there's maybe a point where I can never get over the guilt a hundred percent, but mostly now I'm, I'm speaking out because I believe it's the right thing. And that I also think that I've got an experience that is different. Like most facilitators haven't gone through double blind testing and most critics haven't been facilitators, not, not all, but most, I know right. like James Todd, went through the training and you know there are some people who actually have been trained as facilitators but so that puts me in kind of a unique situation and probably for the first x and number of years that i spoke out it was <coughs> guilt had a lot to do with it but i don't think that that's as true now mm -hmm. i think i i just think that i think it's it's the right thing to do as we should and we're getting on to two hours it goes so fast <laughs> Yeah. And I guess we should conclude this. Um, any parting words from you, Howard? Um, well, I think I've, uh, my parting words um, are take advantage of what's available. And, uh, you know, as far as the um, take, you want to work with, with clinicians who are going to uh, not pick one option, but, but really consider all the available um, possibilities. Um, that's, 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 I think, certainly one lesson. Um, and there are people out there that can, that can give you the guidance uh, to, to allow you to let you, you know, your child, your, your friend, your relative, um, you know, reach their maximum capability. 
you know, take advantage of what uh, the world offers right now. And uh, the other is, is that um, don't accept just one approach. You know, you have to consider all the available options and that's, that's the main thing. And uh, so my, my parting words would be um, keep, keep searching. Um, and the other thing is you have, you, you have to, you have to fight for everything you get and, and, and understand, you have, I think you have to, we all have to understand everybody's side. The school systems um, are, are, they want, they would love to have, you know, 10 more speech pathologists, but they only have three. And, you know, then, then they have to, they have to see 60 kids. Well, it'd be nice if they could see 20, but they can't. And so you've got to understand um, the reality. So what can I do to try to get as much as I can out of the school, try to get some additional help? Um, you know, just, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a struggle. And, um, you know, it's worth it because it's your job. That's the, that's We're hearing we from Linda Rosa, another dear friend of ours. She asks you, is there any advice for activists in alerting the public and challenging universities to promote FC? And that's kind of where Janice and I have been focusing on is that if we educate people and if we can kind of get it ended in the universities, that maybe it will be something that dies out over time. Yeah, and, you know, it's really quite interesting that uh, um, the, at Syracuse, they have a, 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 a student newspaper called the Orange, and you know Janice knows all about this. But um, one of the uh, student editors a few years back started looking into this and realized that it was a big Michael you know, Borman, like Michael Burke. Burke. Michael Burke. We Michael. interviewed him. He's yeah. great. He's yeah, great. unbelievable. And you know that article uh, was you know was just you know fabulous with the uh, what, what they, he had. There was a great title. I forget what it was now, but it was. Fantastic. And, you double know, talk, I think. Something double about talk. double talk. Yeah. yeah, we talked to him and he was surprised at how, how we were so into his writing. He's like, he kind of seemed surprised to get the attention. He was like, yeah, well, <laughs> and we're like, no, no, that was really amazing what you wrote and the follow up and, and yeah, the university had to go, wait a minute. Yeah. What's going went, on here? Part, of the problem, part of the problem is it's not regulated. So um, you know, I mentioned the first line of defense. The first line of defense are good teachers, speech pathologists, psychologists, BCBAs. That's the first line of defense. They're the ones that need to say, wait a minute. And, and, and if the family says, yeah, but we really think it's real, say, okay, let, let's do some testing. It's just not that complicated. But you have to have a first line of defense. If this is just anybody can go do it, you call anybody, uh, then, then you have a problem. But then if you're a speech pathologist, you know, you've been basically told by your association, this is a no-no. Um, this is not uh, something that you know you should be doing, and if you're not going to get any education credits for it. It's not uh, it's not evidence based, and you know on and on and on. But you know some people don't care; they're just going to do it anyway. They are all wrong. We 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 know this works. Wow. Yeah. All right, you all. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us. Today. Thank you. Happy Janice's birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday again. Thank so, you. Uh, Go have some tea on me. Thank you. No, eventually <laughs> not we'll do pouring this. it on you, but uh, to yeah. enjoy your your tea. Well, so this will go up on our YouTube channel. It'll remain here on Facebook for those of you who are interested in watching it on Facebook, along with the conversations people were having in the um, the thread below. And I put many links in there to our website as well as to Howard Shane's Wikipedia page and some other things that are in the links and we'll put those in the YouTube video so if people would um, share uh, you know education is how we're going to get through this I think and and so I appreciate it we have I have no new talk scheduled for next week for about time presence which is a shock I was doing <laughs> three or four a week and now I just kind of got slack and haven't really done any but they will come up and if people are interested in suggesting other people for us to talk to whether it has anything to do with facilitated communication or not um i have all kinds of in, you know uh interesting people out there i'd like to communicate with and i'm dying to read your memoir that's going to be great and i i'm going to take some time today and read about the vulture town uh, school because I had never heard of that before and it seems like it's the Wikipedia page at least and all the links on it look really fascinating. I think I'm going to have a full day. <laughs> and again, they want to eventually hook up with uh, Kate Anderson. 
I, I right. connect connect with me. I'll send you her link. Okay, fantastic. All right, Bye. everybody. Thank you so much, and I uh, appreciate it. I'm glad your internet eventually worked after all. <laughs> it made it much more interesting conversation to be able to see in your house. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thanks.